Those of you guys I haven't met yet, uh, it's spelled F-A-D-U-I. I'll spare you the diagrams. I did last time when I spoke at DOXA. Uh, any freshmen in the house? Okay, can you just like stand up or raise your hand? Come on, where are my freshmen? Yeah, can we just, good job, good job. Way to be here. Man, I, I am just so proud of all the freshmen that, that made it out. Can my sophomores make some noise? Okay, all right, settle down. Any juniors in the house? All right, okay, okay. Any seniors in the house? Love it, love it. All right. Uh, so, I am going to just uh, read this one passage of scripture real quick, and then we are going to pray. Sound good? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. We are grateful to be your people, to be gathered here today, to hear from you this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask you to custom fit the words of this message to meet every need in this room, to speak to every heart here today by your power and through your word. In Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's beautiful people said, Amen, Amen. amen. All right, let me start my little timer here. So, Today we're going to be talking about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And uh, I got to say, uh, teaching on this topic is kind of a tall order uh, because we're going to cover a lot of uh, ground today. So this is not going to be a three-point sermon. Uh, I'm going to have a bunch of three-pointers in there just for all the Baptists in the house. And uh, I will probably not answer, it's, I'm Baptist, it's all good, it's all good. Yeah. Um, and I probably won't answer all your questions, and that's totally okay. If I, if I raise questions for you, that's a good thing. You can dig into your Bible and, get, and, and have opportunity to meet God and learn from the Holy Spirit yourself. And uh, so, yeah, if it feels like a marathon, uh, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Uh, so I hope it feels less like this. I hope, it feel, I hope it doesn't feel like that. I hope it feels more like this. Or like this. Yeah, all right. Glory to God. The first part, okay, of what we're going to cover uh, in our time together this morning will be who is the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're going to do a flyover. Uh, if you want to take notes, uh, uh, I highly encourage you to do that. And the second part will be, um, so the first part, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. The second part will be the filling of the Holy Spirit. Find one person around you and just give them a big smile and tell them, get ready. Okay. All right. Just get ready, not your whole life story. All right. Who is the Holy Spirit? Okay. The Holy Spirit is God. We believe that God is one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One plus one plus one equals one. It's totally, you know, it's just one of those mysteries that we as Christians embrace by faith. Uh, okay. Uh, this, uh, this is a diagram that I've kind of found helpful before. Uh, I'll just shoot this out to, to those who need it. So God is one, uh, but he's Father, Son, and Spirit. And we see this unfolding of the mystery of who God is throughout the scriptures, right? In the Old Testament, we hear over and over that God is one. And we get to meet God as our creator, our maker, our helper, the one who redeems us. He's our king. And then, okay, after years of silence, Jesus steps in on the scene and he says, I am the son of God. And so God enters history as the man, Jesus Christ, and we get to meet God the son. And through God the son, we also get to know God the father as our father. And so now we have God the Son, we have God the Father, and then unfolding even more throughout the New Testament, uh, Jesus says, it's better for you that I go, so then I will send you the Helper, the Holy Spirit, who is God's Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. And so we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. Uh, one way to illustrate this would be if uh, you're in a room, God the Father would give the command to let there be light. God the Son would then turn on the switch. God, the Holy Spirit, is the electricity that powers the light in the room, the operational power of God. In Genesis 1, we see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, 
Holy Spirit is eternal. He was involved in creation, bringing about life along with the Father and the Son. And now he is God on the earth. He's the God you hear. He is the God you receive from. He's the God you are empowered by. He's the God you interact with. God the Father is in heaven on the throne. Jesus Christ is at his right hand. And the Holy Spirit is God on the earth. And uh, just to touch on this theme real quick, God desires to live with his people. And we see this from the very, very beginning, right? God creates Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 and 2, and, uh, and he lives with them. He creates them to be with him in full, unhindered, intimate fellowship with God. But then sin happens and brokenness and rebellion. And uh, God loves us so much, though, that still he wants to live with us, right? He gives Moses very detailed uh, plans on how to erect the, uh, uh, the tabernacle and how to build a tent of meeting. And sure enough, God comes and fills it because he wants to live with his people. And then even later, Solomon builds a temple and God's presence again fills it. God's spirit fills the temple because God wants to live with his people. And then finally, in Acts chapter 2, we see the culmination of that when God sends his spirit on all people, on all Christians, on all those who call on the name of the Lord. God's spirit comes and lives with them. And once again, God is with his people. He's in his people. Real quick, uh, what does the Holy Spirit do? As if you could do it real quick. Um, John 14, 26 says, but the helper, oops, <laughs> we'll, come to, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And, and we learn from the passage that God the Holy Spirit is our helper. He's our teacher. He's our guide. And Titus 3.5 says that God saved us not because of works done in right, by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And we see this other aspect of the Holy Spirit's work where he's actually the one who implements and carries out salvation in our hearts. He's the one who renews our hearts. He's the one who quick and jump starts our dead hearts back to life. And this is one of my favorite passages of all time. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The Holy Spirit in us creates an abundance of hope. What I like to call biblical optimism. Okay, let me see those pearly whites. Biblical optimism. <laughs> And so much more. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. He helps us understand the word when we read it. He helps us overcome temptation. He reminds us who we are. And he reminds us whose we are. He inspires us. Uh, it's not very popular. But to live in holiness. To live and have power over sin. That prompting you feel to pull away from sin and to say no to temptation, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. The prompting you feel to come clean and open up to a brother or sister and confess a sin or share a struggle, that is the prompting of the Holy Spirit wanting you to live in obedience and in freedom. And lastly, he bears fruit in us. Aren't these awesome? This is the fruit he bears in us. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, we're done with that. All right. So uh, there are two particular images in the scriptures that I want to focus on uh, for the next few minutes that help us uh, understand the Holy Spirit. Okay. The first one is water. Somebody say agua. Agua. You know what? I'm going to teach you the Arabic word for it. It's maya. 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 Yeah. What I just drank. So John... 30, uh, John 7, 37 says this. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Man, I love this. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he says the Holy Spirit is like living waters bursting from your heart in overflow. And it's really cool that Jesus used the analogy of water here, because water is the element and substance of life. 
your body is made up two-thirds of water. 70% of our planet is covered in water. And uh, plants and trees don't just need sun to grow, they need water. Oh, come on, you guys, wake up. And when there is no water, okay, there is fatigue, okay, when you, when you don't hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Uh, there's otherwise fatigue, tiredness, constipation. Uh, uh, but even on the earth, drought, famine, and ultimately death when there is no water. So Jesus uses this analogy of water to tell us about the Holy Spirit. And here are three quick observations, okay, about the Holy Spirit as, as water. First, the Holy Spirit releases life. The Holy Spirit releases life. Romans 8 says, the Spirit gives life to your bodies. And in Genesis 2, 7 says, the Lord God created man and breathed into him the breath of life. The Holy Spirit releases life to all of creation and to us physically and spiritually. What we just read in Titus, right? He is the one who quickens our dead hearts back to life. The Holy Spirit releases life. Secondly, the Holy Spirit renovates the soul. He renovates the soul. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Like water washes and, and, and cleanses, the Holy Spirit does this washing work in our souls. He purifies. Ephesians 4.23 says, Let the Spirit renew, wash over your thoughts and attitudes. And the Spirit... Uh, does that work in the soul. The Spirit renovates the soul. And then thirdly, and this is very important, the Spirit also restores unity. The Spirit restores unity. Imagine uh, uh, for a second uh, uh, with me how water brings so much unity in a village where everybody is dependent on one well and they all share it. And uh, at a certain time of the day, the whole village just gathers to drink from the same well. Or uh, everybody just swimming in the same ocean, united, united by what brings us together. And so in Acts 2, we see incredible unity when the Holy Spirit fell on the church. Incredible unity. It says at the end of Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. When the Holy Spirit came, they devoted themselves to Bible course. So let's say amen. amen. They devoted themselves to doxa. It says, and the fellowship and breaking of bread and to the prayers. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. The Holy Spirit restores unity to the body of Christ. In Acts 4, again, there's a prayer meeting where at the end of it, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And like water can unify and bring together and hydrate and give life. So the Holy Spirit releases life, and he renovates the soul, and he restores unity. Oops. Yep, that's the Holy Spirit right there. It's the water. Um, forgot how to use my directions on here. Okay, uh, this, is, this is a really cool passage to kind of make the, the point on you. You can write the reference down. But verse 3 says, being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Why? Because we are one, united by the Spirit. So in Jesus' water analogy, we see the Holy Spirit releasing life, washing, renovating the soul, and restoring unity. And the scriptures also refer to the Holy Spirit as breath or wind. Okay, check this out. John 20, verse 22. The weirdest thing. Jesus hanging out with his disciples, and when he had said this, the scriptures say he breathed on them. And said, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. Why don't you all just take a deep breath right now? Just take one deep breath. Just breathe. Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting is that the word spirit, okay, in Hebrew and Greek, okay, ruach. Somebody say ruach. Ruach. It means spirit, wind, breath, soul, and the same word in the Greek, in the New Testament, pneuma, it means the same thing. Spirit, wind, breath, soul. And Paul says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And there's this aspect of communion and fellowship that comes through the Holy Spirit, okay? And the first thing we notice about that is intimacy. Intimacy. Man, the people that can smell your breath, and tell you 
Sister, you need a breath mint. Or brother, you need a breath mint. Man, they get close. <sighs> Jesus got real close to the disciples. <sighs> Received the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he didn't have no mentos back then. You better hope he smelled good. <laughs> but this first aspect we see in this breath analogy is the intimacy of the Spirit. The intimacy of the Spirit. Intimacy is about having things between two people that no one else is privy to. Do you have intimacy with the Spirit? Do you have this closeness? God desires it. Do you have a history with God? Do you have things between you and the Lord that nobody else knows about? Intimacy with the Spirit. If you don't, it's time to cultivate that. To have things between just you and the Lord as your dear, close friend. The second thing we see is this presence of the Spirit, this atmosphere-like presence that this ruach of God, that this breath, this wind of God has. You know, we, we, we sing about it. The atmosphere is changing now for the Spirit of the Lord is here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this and fill the atmosphere. Atmosphere is literally the air that envelops and surrounds the earth. And there's this atmosphere-like quality to the presence of the Spirit of God. And Jesus models this awareness of God's presence so well to us uh, in the scriptures. Man, in, in Exodus, we read about how the glory, the presence of God, so filled the, the tent of meeting where Moses met with Jesus that afterwards his face what? Glowed. Yeah. Shone, radiated. Why? From, from this presence. And in Second Chronicles, when uh, the temple is built, and Solomon dedicates it to the Lord, God's presence, God's glory, God's atmosphere so fills and floods the temple, it says the priests were unable to do their duties. <laughs> they just could not work, okay? Because the presence was so thick, just there, when God shows up. <laughs> and then in Acts, again, we see this happening, you know, when, when, um, when the Holy Spirit falls on them in Acts 2. But even later, when, when Peter is walking on the streets and people line up the sick for his shadow, and his shadow somehow has this substance that actually heals people, where when people, sick people, uh, when Peter's shadow passes by them, they are healed. That's insane. Peter is full of the presence of God. The presence of God. So we see the intimacy of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit, and thirdly, the authority of the Spirit, right? The Spirit being like wind. In Acts 2, it says he came like a mighty rushing wind. Check this out. You know that you cannot control the wind? You cannot control the wind. You just submit to the authority and the direction of the wind. Jesus, talking to Nicodemus in, in, in John chapter 3, he says, The wind blows where it The wind blows where it wishes, the wind blows where it wills. And you have no authority over the wind. And in our relationship with, with the Holy Spirit, we need to just surrender in the details. You cannot be in control and the Holy Spirit in control at the same time. Okay? Like a skilled sailor, we need to just learn to go with the wind and navigate with the wind. So let's just give up control and, and, and say yes to the authority of the Spirit of God in our lives, leading us and guiding us. Okay, moving right along. Hit water, hit wind, fire. Yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, as we transition, okay, and, and now we're going to talk about the filling of the Spirit. Uh, I know that some of this stuff is controversial in, in many Christian circles, okay? But, okay... I want to preface with this. I want to tell you that just because some of these gifts we're going to talk about have been abused doesn't mean that we should just toss out the baby with the bathwater. Okay? Don't let extremists on either side rob you of your inheritance from God. Don't let the crazies, okay, and the other side of the crazies, okay, <laughs> steal from you what God wants to give you, okay? So just let's just open up uh, our hearts as we, as we approach the scriptures together this morning, okay? Luke, affectionately referred to as the theologian of the Holy Spirit, okay? We're going to be reading a lot of Luke today. He also wrote the book of Acts. So everybody say, what's up, Luke? What's up? 
What's up, Luke? What's up, Luke? All right. Luke 3, 16, okay? John, the Baptist, answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is coming is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with? And? Fire. Come on, you could do better. He will baptize you with? The Holy Spirit. And? Fire. Okay, so the word baptize there, okay, is literally a word that, like, nobody bothered to translate. We just took it from the Greek and transliterated it, and uh, it's a Greek word, uh, baptizo, and somebody just got lazy and said, okay, we'll just baptize, okay, we'll just, that's what we're, it's going to be in English. And it literally means to, to submerge, okay, to, to completely dunk or, or immerse, okay. I love to baptizo my, you know, cookie in, like, <laughs> oh my gosh, the most delicious baptism. <laughs> so John says Jesus will baptize you, will immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And reading on, Luke 3, uh, verse 22 says Jesus is baptized, okay, by John, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus in the form of a dove, okay? And then in Luke 4 1, it says Jesus was full of the Spirit, okay? The other half of that verse says Jesus was led by the Spirit. And then in 4 14, it says Jesus returned in the power of the in the power of the Spirit. And I just want to observe there for a second. Guys, if Jesus needed to be led and filled and anointed by uh, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, how much more do we? Yeah. How much more we? Acts 10, 38. Man, amazing verse. says, Peter is preaching. He says, you yourselves know how God anointed the whole Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Somebody say power. power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And Jesus models for us this life that is filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with power. And in John 14, one of Jesus' last meetings with the disciples, they're hanging out and he tells them, uh, you know the works that you've seen me do, all these like crazy miracles? You are going to do the same works and greater because I am going to the Father. And when I go to the Father, I will send you the promised Holy Spirit to empower you to do these same things. And then the very last thing we read in Luke 24, uh, verse 49, Jesus says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Somebody say, dress me up. Yes. Yeah. Clothed with power from on high. Okay, uh, man, my favorite picture for this is um, anybody see Iron Man movies? Yes. Okay, yeah, praise God, glory, glory. And uh, like Tony Stark just goes, and then the suit is like, and he's like ready to go. This is the picture I, I think. Clothed with power from on high. Now, when does this happen? Somebody help me out. When is this fulfilled? Acts 2. Acts 2, okay, let's go there. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let me give you a working definition for being filled with the Spirit, okay? What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? To be filled with the Spirit is to be clothed with extraordinary power by the Holy Spirit to advance the mission of God. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be clothed with extraordinary power by the Holy Spirit in order to advance the mission of God. Okay, you guys doing good? Okay, two of you? Great. Let's look at this act passage, and I want to make three observations from what we just read. Okay? These are the last three. Uh, the second to last trio you're going to get today. Three observations from Acts 2. The first is that this clothing with power is for the believer. Okay? This clothing of power by the Spirit to advance the mission of God 
is for the believers. We know that the people in Acts 2 who were gathered praying, they were believers, they were Christians. And then again in Acts 8 and in Acts 10, they had all believed, okay? They were believers. Now, what does it mean to be a believer? Good question. Glad you asked. <laughs> to be a believer, okay, is to be born again by the Spirit of God. To have a new heart. To be born again by the Spirit of God. And, and this is a work that God does in our lives by His grace when we believe the gospel. When we embrace the good news. What is the gospel? Great question. Come to Bible course this week. <laughs> no, seriously. Okay, 30 seconds. What is the gospel? The gospel is that even though we rebelled against God and we were dead in our sins, God in his love entered human history as the man Jesus Christ and on the cross took the fullness and weight of our sin, fallenness and corruption and darkness, took him with him to the grave. And on the third day he was raised to life again. And he was uh, ascended to heaven and now offers everyone who receives him new life. He offers it freely to us. That is the gospel. That is the good news. That you can become a new creation. That you can have eternal life. That you can live a life that is way greater. That goes way beyond your own natural abilities. The gospel is, very simply put, Jesus died for your sins in accordance with the scriptures. And now offers you new life by faith in Jesus. And I will say just in tandem with the first point, this clothing of power from on high is for the believers. If you're not a believer and you haven't received this good news and you know in your heart you need, you need Jesus, look, today is as good a day as any to say yes to Jesus. T today, today, right now, you can say, yes, Jesus, I believe what you have done on my behalf. I believe that you died my death and I believe that I can have new life by faith in you. God bless you. <laughs> Okay, this clothing of power is for the believer. And I just want to make another observation real quick. In Luke 3, okay, uh, Luke the author, he refers to, to this event, this encounter, as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then in, uh, at the end of Luke, he refers to it as a clothing uh, of power from on high. And then again, the same author in Acts 2 refers to it as being filled with the Spirit. So which one is it? Is it baptized or filled? And I would say... That Luke uses, and you can see this in the book of Acts, Luke, Luke, Luke uses the language of baptism and filling interchangeably. interchangeably. To Luke, okay, for, for Luke, to be baptized is synonymous with being filled with the Spirit. Now, why is this important? Because we need to answer the question, when do you have the Holy Spirit? Okay, is it when you first believe in Jesus? Is it when you have a second experience of being baptized with the Spirit? Is it when you are filled with the Holy Spirit and feel this power upon you? Is it when He manifests in you a new spiritual gift or gives you boldness? And the answer is yes. Yes. Check this out. Paul, in Romans 6, uses this baptism language, okay, to talk about our incorporation into the body of Christ. He essentially says that when you become a Christian, okay, the Holy Spirit, you're baptizing the Spirit into the body of Christ. So when you get saved, okay, you receive a baptism of the Spirit. You, you have the Holy Spirit. And in because in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, no one can say that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't stop there, okay? It does not stop there. Let's look at Peter, for example. Which time was Peter filled with the Spirit? Okay, is it in John 20 when uh, Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit? Is it in Acts chapter 2 where he was in the upper room and the Holy Spirit fell upon everybody there and he was filled with the Spirit? Or is it Acts 4, 8 when uh, he received boldness and it says he was filled with the Spirit to speak to the authorities? Or was it at the end of chapter 4, uh, verse 31 at the prayer meeting where again he was there and the Spirit fell on everybody and says he was filled with the Spirit? Which one of those times? Yes, yes, that's, that's the answer. Here's one way we can say this, okay? There is one baptism with many fillings, okay? There's one baptism where when you get baptized, where when you get baptized in the Spirit, when you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit and many fillings, okay? Check this out. This filling of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing lifestyle. We are filled with the Spirit every day. 
Acts 2. <laughs> Acts 4. <laughs> Acts 2017. Oh. <laughs> Expect more from God. Wherever you're at today, if you have received a filling, if you have not received a filling, if you're uh, a Christian with much experience with the Holy Spirit, receive more from God. Expect that He has more for you. Yes, Jesus. Amen. More God. Yes, Lord. Okay, we're Okay. Yeah. Good job, balloon. That was... So, guys, like, it, 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 and I've kind of fallen into these errors before, but if you believe, for example, that uh, when you get saved, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's it, you're good, you don't need anything else, man, you're just going to miss out on so much that God has for you. And the other extreme where, well, if you uh, receive the baptism of the Spirit and you speak in tongues, that's it, you're, you're filled with the Spirit, you're good to go. Man, you're just going to miss out on what God has for you. God has more for you wherever you're at. Okay, sometimes Peter was filled with the Spirit and he spoke in tongues. Other times, he prophesied. Other times, it was just boldness. In Acts 2, those filled with the Spirit spoke in tongues. In Acts 4, they were filled with boldness. In Acts 9, Paul was saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's it. He was baptized in water. It doesn't say anything else. In Acts 10, mid-sermon, the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and all of his household. And they were all filled with the Spirit. And uh, they all spoke in tongues. In Acts 13, Paul was filled with the Spirit again and with power this time and he performed a miracle and a bunch of people got saved in acts 13 at the end of it the disciples were filled with the holy spirit this time it says and with joy joy let me see those pearly whites again they were filled with the holy spirit and with joy that was a manifestation acts 19 uh, a group of other disciples are filled with the holy spirit and this time they speak in tongues and they prophesy so i want to tell you that god does it differently every time God does it differently every time. Your experience is going to look totally different from my experience and from other people's experience in this room. Let me share with you a few stories, okay? This is from history. We just did the book of Acts. Anybody heard of D.L. Moody? Yeah. Okay, D.L. Moody. Great evangelist. Um, there's like a school named after him. My brother went to study there. And uh, a great guy. Okay, great man of God. He was a minister, okay? He was a pastor. He was itinerant. He was an evangelist, okay? He was doing tons of ministry. Believer. Loves the Lord. A couple of old ladies, okay, have been praying for him. Anybody grateful for old ladies praying? Yes. yes. Man, I wish they invited that Asian lady that was here last time. I was at Doc's so That was great. Um, <laughs> I was hoping one of you guys invited her for today. <laughs> for those of you guys who weren't there, we'll just yes. play with it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So, so D.L. Moody is like, uh, ladies, why are you praying for me? Shouldn't you be praying for some not Christian to get saved? And they're like, Brother Moody, we are praying for you to receive power. Here's the rest of the story. He says, okay, let's stop praying for me and pray with me. And so he joins them and they pray. And here's, here's the rest of the account. Not long after, one day on his way to England, he was walking up Wall Street in New York. And in the midst of the bustle and hurry of that city, his prayer was answered. The power of God fell upon him as he walked upon the streets and he had to hurry off to the house of a friend and ask that he might have a room by himself. And in the room he stayed alone for hours and the Holy Ghost came upon him, filling his soul with such joy that at last he had to ask God to withhold his hand lest he die on the spot from very joy. He went out from that place with the power of the Holy Ghost upon him and when he got to London, the power of God wrought through him mightily in North London. Check this out. And hundreds were added to the churches. And that was what led to him being invited over to the wonderful campaign that followed years later. Man, Chris Tomlin. You ever heard of Chris Tomlin? Yeah, yeah man. Praise God for Chris Tomlin. How great is our God is greater. <laughs> man, I went to see Chris Tomlin in concert once. And, and he started telling us his story. He was like, man, I was at a camp. Much like this. Many, many years ago. And uh, I, was, I was just a youth. And I was leading worship. And the speaker came up to me after and, and laid hands on me and prayed for me and I felt this electricity go through my body. And then the speaker gave me a prophetic word. He said, Chris, you are going to be a songwriter for your generation. This was way, way back when no name Chris Tom had a powerful encounter with the Lord. Great uh, evangelist and minister named Smith Wigglesworth. Okay, I love Smith. He's got some crazy stories. Smith Wigglesworth 
took a friend of his and went to visit, again, an old lady to go pray for her. She was sick. And in their living room, Smith just sat on the couch by himself and had the most powerful encounter with the Lord ever. Nobody prayed for him. Nobody laid hands on him. It was just him. And, and, and he describes it in very vivid details. Look that up. It's, it's cool. Charles Finney, another, another great evangelist, won hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord, describes his experience as waves upon waves of liquid love washing over him. What? What does that even mean? Man, uh, one of my heroes, uh, Justin Kendrick, uh, tells, tells his story this way. He says he was just at, at some church service and he went up to the front to receive prayer and he ended up being flat on the floor for an hour, unable to move, unable to get up, just under the power of God. And when he got up, he felt like a different man. Man, he didn't speak in tongues, he didn't prophesy, he just got up and felt like a different man. Another time later, God met him and he received the gift of speaking in tongues. And now he's planted like several churches in Connecticut by the grace of God. And, and we're seeing like New England's church landscape uh, really impacted by his ministry. One of the pastors who mentored me, his wife, uh, was telling us a story. She had been pursuing the Lord. Uh, for specifically a baptism of the Holy Spirit and just the gift of being able to, to have a prayer language. She said she prayed on her own, on her bed, every night for six months straight. And one night, one night, yeah, God came and visited her in power. It was amazing. My little brother, Joe, his experiences, he was in a, God bless you. Uh, he was in a, a room, uh, not much different than this, with Hillsong blaring from the speakers. Uh, I was there with him, and uh, uh, a group of youth just seeking God together, just praying. Man. And he received a mighty encounter with the Lord. Why? Why would God do it so differently every time? That makes, like, no sense. Right? It would be so nice and clean if we were just like, okay, uh, step one, check. Step two, check. You're good to go. Uh, everything looks the same. Everything's uniform. Do you know that...